Hey everyone, thanks for watching Test 2 Plus today. I'm Trace, this is a show where we take a big topic and we break it into a five episode series. This is episode two, and we are talking about space travel. Yesterday we talked about when and how space travel first became a reality, and also some notable dates in space history. But let's talk about the people that have to ride those rockets into space, which is just insane. Sitting on a giant missile and going into space. What's that about? In the beginning, of course, we were just sending the machines up, you know, like Sputnik and Explorer 1, and they were just going up there and orbiting. Then we sent animals to make sure things were okay and that we could somehow survive up there. Dogs, monkeys, you know, all sorts of things. And finally, people. And how do you pick people to go to space? That's, I mean, that's a pretty interesting question. You don't know what's out there. You don't know what happens. You have to pick a specific individuals to go. So in 1959, NASA, which had only been founded, you know, a short time before, asked the military to list members who met some specific qualifications, which included jet aircraft experience, engineering training, and who were not taller than 5 foot 11, because every little inch counts when it comes to shooting something into space. Every pound, every kilogram, it's important to make sure to account for. So shorter people were actually better for space travel. They ended up selecting seven men, and they called them astronauts. They named them after balloonists, who were called argonauts, because they were to sail to a new uncharted ocean. They wanted people who had above average health, not just physically. They weren't just physically strong, but they were also psychologically strong, because they had to endure a lot, because they didn't, again, know what was going on. They wanted people who had above average health, not just, you know, physically, like, they, that's, that's important, but also psychologically, because they were going to have to endure a lot and be under a lot of scrutiny and pressure. They picked these seven guys for the Mercury Space Program, the first men to go into space, and they put them through every laboratory test they could think of. NASA lists it on their website, and they say they x-ray mapped each man's body. They thoroughly inspected their eyes, ears, nose, and throat. They put them through chemical, encephalographic, and cardiographic tests. They, spot, they had special physiological examinations that they invented just to see what was going to happen when they made them ride a bicycle for a long time, and they checked their radiation count, they checked how much water was in their body, they checked the specific gravity of the whole body, they mapped their heart, they did all of this stuff. And they think that it might actually be the most complete medical history on any human ever. <laughs> because they honestly did not know what was going to happen. In 1964, after of course successfully launching these men into space, they started recruiting more astronauts and getting more people. And as they recruited more and more, they realized maybe it was better not to just have engineers and test pilots and, you know, jet aircraft pilots, but also scientists. So they switched to academics from flight experience and recru recruited scientist astronauts, where a minimum doctorate level degree or equivalent experience was required in order for you to become an astronaut. They asked for people who were good in the natural sciences and medicine and engineering. Today, Funnily enough, in 2013, they just started a new astronaut class, and you could have applied for, to be an astronaut on the government's website for job applications, usajobs.gov, which is crazy. They did not, unfortunately, want a psych major who knows how to make internet stuff, but, you know, you got to try, right? The basic qualifications that they wanted for astronauts today are a bachelor's degree in engineering, biological science, physical science, or math, three years of related professional experience, or 1,000 hours of pilot in command jet aircraft, or an advanced degree in some kind of engineering or math, etc. Basically, they also wanted to make sure that you could pass their long-duration spaceflight physical, which is essentially a really intense physical. You also have to be a U.S. citizen or dual citizenship, which is kind of funny. The thing is, though, once you're selected, that's the easy part. It seems like all of those things, that seems pretty tough, right? But once you're selected, you have to pass astronaut training. Now, to go back a little bit to the Mercury 7, I went to a lecture with John Glenn, first man to orbit, first American to orbit the Earth, and Michael Collins, who uh, you may recognize from the Apollo program. And 
they said at this lecture at the Smithsonian that they literally put them through every test they could think of. But there was always a doctor who would do it first because they were too expensive. And they didn't know, again, what would happen. So they did this test called the EIEO test, or eyes in, eyes out, eyeballs in, eyeballs out. Remember those centrifuges that you see in movies that just spin around and around and around and around really fast? Apparently, those can go at such a high rate and then completely swap the rate, as in the little canister that they're sitting in flips around 180 degrees and they're instantly going the opposite direction as far as their body's concerned. So they wanted to test this on a very high level of G's. So the doctor got in and he did it and he had the test stopped because he was hitting like seven, eight, nine G's and then they flipped him around and wow, did he start coughing and he was very uncomfortable. So they stopped the test, they pulled him out and after some assessment, it turned out that all of his internal organs had gone from laying against his back to slamming into the back of his rib cage. This was a test that they wanted to do because they didn't know and they thought maybe they would be subjected to these G's if something went wrong. Hopefully they weren't because they never tested that on the actual astronauts. Today they don't do stuff like that anymore. It's not quite as intense as all that because we have a better idea of what's going on in space. The new class in 2013 included four men and four women, many of them in the military, many of them with PhDs and degrees in mathematics, engineering, and the sciences in general. They had a two-year training program that they should be coming out of just about now, I hope. We should see them coming out pretty soon. Some funny things from astronaut training that I thought might be interesting to talk about are that you have to be scuba qualified because you have to be able to swim in space, I guess. But scuba qualified so that you can prepare for spacewalk training. You have to be able to swim in your flight suit plus shoes, they mentioned that, for three pool lengths and tread water in that garb for 10 minutes. That seems pretty tough, although there's no time requirement. You can do it in as long as it takes you to do it. The Vomit Comet, which is a 747 that goes up in a big parabolic thing and then comes down to drop pretty much at the rate of gravity, so you experience weightlessness. Maybe you've heard of this. They filmed the entirety of Apollo 13 on the Vomit Comet. Whenever they're floating, they're actually freaking floating, which is crazy. And they did this for astronaut training. They might do it as many as 40 times a day. They call it a Vomit Comet for a reason. It gives you about 20 seconds of weightlessness. They also do atmospheric pressure training, which is fairly intense, and not to mention actual systems training. You have to learn all of the aircraft systems, how everything works, how they work in your equipment and also others' equipments, like the Soyuz capsule that you'd have to use if you left the ISS, and know how to read all of the manuals and understand all these other things. It's crazy, and that's on top of the physical training. Robert Heinlein is a uh, science fiction author really great science fiction author, and he has a quote that NASA used in their astronaut training manual, and it said, once you get to Earth orbit, you're halfway to anywhere in the solar system, which is pretty awesome. So as far as NASA is concerned, there have been over 200 astronauts from 46 states and the District of Columbia. And those people have gone through this whole astronaut training, which is crazy, and most of them for some reason are from Ohio or New York. New York, I get. It's a huge population, but Ohio? What's up with that? It's the birthplace of aviation, sure, but it has more than 25 different astronauts. 78 space flights, three trips to the moon, 22,000 hours in space. The first person to walk on the moon, Neil Armstrong, Ohio. First American to orbit the Earth, John Glenn, Ohio. What's up, Ohio? I'm from Michigan. I'm not supposed to like give you props, but what up, props? That's a lot of astronauts. Unfortunately, however, Judith Resnick was an astronaut who was from Ohio as well. And if you want to know more about her, you'll have to come back tomorrow. Did you ever dream about being an astronaut? I definitely dreamed about it. I went to space camp when I was a kid. I am that nerd and it was awesome. Let's talk about it down in the comments. And also subscribe for more Test Tube Plus. If you missed our first episode yesterday, check that out. And also if you haven't and you want to listen to one of these Test Tube Pluses in a whole group, check us out over on iTunes and shoot us a rating as well. We'd really appreciate it. Uh, and also, remember, tomorrow we're going to talk a little bit more about what's up with the space shuttle and how it killed a lot of people. Thanks for watching Test Tube Plus.